As it was my grandmother-in-law's birthday party yesterday, which we hosted here, the last thing I was able to do was watch a Grand Prix. So if you're wondering where that video is, well, it's, um, well, it, it's not here. I don't see the point in reviewing stuff that I didn't see, if you're with me on that one. At least I hope you're with me on that one. You know the hardest part of these videos is the intros? Anyway, shall we move on to something educational and or interesting? Because that's what you're usually here for, isn't it? Formula One is an engineering contest more than it is a driving one. Always has been that way and will probably always will be that way. People like to say it's the car when the driver they don't like is winning and then say talent when it's their guy that's winning a lot and so on. Because let's face it, nobody won anything in a 40 or a LaRouze or a Simtek or an Andrea Moda. Even Max Verstappen would struggle to get an Andrea Moda on the grid. But things were different back then, and we expanded on all this in the last video I did, which was about the McLaren MP411. By the 1990s, the days of turning up with a car, driver, gearbox and a dream was dying out, and paving the way for the manufacturers to take over around the turn of the century. The days of the true privateer were, for all intents and purposes, over. Even Frank Williams sold a part of his soul to the big boys. And Eddie Jordan is considered the last of the privateers because it was still his team until the end of 2004, until it became Jordan in name only for 2005. Minardi swapped hands when it was bought by Paul Stoddart and Sauber stayed alive through having some pretty wealthy shareholders as well as Peter. So to come in as a privateer, you needed money. And lots of it. Because you wouldn't be competitive without any money. And if you were a privateer trying to enter Formula 1 in the 2000s, it made much more sense to buy an existing team than to set one up from scratch. The troubles experienced by the 2010 trio are well documented, with Haas surviving for nearly 10 years now. But others? They bought in. Why? Because the facilities already exist. You've saved yourself a lot of time and resources just by doing that. And that's what VJ Malia did at the end of 2007 when he bought the Spiker team. The team was renamed Force India, and while their first season was a bit iffy with them scoring zero points, things were going to pick up. Because really, they only had to do one season under the 2008 regulations, before the 2009 ones kicked in and they got a reset, along with everybody else. Over the next few years, Force India carried on the legacy that their great-grandfather team established, being solid mid-grid runners despite their meagre budgets. And drivers like Sergio Perez were semi-regular visitors to the podium. It was quite apt, given that the great-grandfather team in question was Jordan, a team that often defied the odds. But by 2018, things were not pretty at Force India. The administrators had been called in, with Sergio Perez being at the front of that. Perez had been told that this was something that he could do in the UK because it meant the team could continue to operate without being shut down and the administrators would then look at selling bits of the team off or otherwise removing the debts owed. And Perez had also done it as a means of avoiding a winding up order issued by Her Majesty's Tax Rosers. At the end of this saga, a consortium led by Lawrence Stroll bought the team, renamed it Racing Point, and it's now Aston Martin. And in its short history, Racing Point managed to do two things. Number one, have the worst team name in Formula 1 history, and it is a terrible name for a racing team, but in 2020, they managed to clone somebody else's car. During the 2019 season, Racing Point had identified several issues with the car. Not only that, the issues were piling up year on year, but despite this, the team was finishing in the mid-pack of the Constructors' Championship, with them finishing 5th in 2015 and 4th in 2016 and 2017. In 2018, they were excluded from the Championship due to the Stroll Consortium takeover, which is just part of the process, rather than anything else. Officially, Force India scored zero points in 2018. And when I say that they finished fifth in 2015 and fourth in 2016 and 2017, that was of course as Force India, not as Racing Point. They became Racing Point off the back of Force India with the takeover. You know what I mean. But Racing Point's first full season wasn't the same as the previous two. In 2019, the team slipped backwards, with Perez and Stroll on the edge of making the top 10, just not really breaking into it that often. At least, not in the early part of the season anyway. In the latter part of the season following the Hungarian Grand Prix, Perez managed to rescue his season, scoring a string of top 10s, with the exception being his retirement at Singapore. Stroll, meanwhile, continued to knock on the door of the top 10, but not quite get in. 
But the team had identified something that wasn't quite right with the car, at least aerodynamically, there wasn't something right with the car. So for the second half of 2019 and then into 2020, they decided to try something quite radical. Now what they did wasn't easy, because the rules in Formula 1 state that all teams must design their own cars and must own all the intellectual property associated with those cars. And this rule has caused some controversy in the past, with Red Bull setting up an external company to design cars, and then the Red Bulls and Toro Rossos were the same cars for a couple of years. But the loophole that exploited had since been shut. Dallara was building cars for Haas, which was well within the rules as well. But Racing Point's approach went a bit further than what Red Bull and Haas has ever done. In 2019, Racing Point was running a high rake car. What this means is the front of the car is running low to the ground and the rear is high up. And this is done for two reasons. One, to maximize the suction from the diffuser, and secondly, to make the car fall over in the corners, with the forces generated from that helping the car to rotate on the front axle something Red Bull exploited better than anybody else and became the philosophy to follow when the FIA changed the floor regulations for 2021. So Racing Point tried something different in the latter part of 2019 and then started applying that to the 2019 car ready for 2020. Basically they said what if we went low rake like Mercedes were doing? They put their car in the CFD program, lowered the rake and then realized they'd lost 40 points of downforce on the front end but the main issue was making sure it all worked properly because they had to somehow recover that lost downforce and do it by literal reverse engineering. Racing Point was already buying engines and gearboxes from Mercedes, so they knew roughly how everything worked at the rear end. They'd go similar rear ends anyway because of the way the Mercedes assembly was. So that information was already to hand. It was just the rest of it they had to figure out. Mercedes was not allowed to supply Racing Point with anything other than the listed parts. These being the approved parts that other teams can buy from other teams. So you can buy suspension parts from another team, gearboxes from another team and so on. So with all the information they had with regards to the rear end of the car, Racing Point started at the back and moved their way forward. Their only references were photographs and even then that was going to be tricky because photographs are two dimensional and there's all sorts of stuff interfering like shadows, reflections and everything else besides. Gary Anderson said that if you're trying to follow another team's lead, you have to work with what you can actually see. When he was at Jordan, they would get photographers to get shots of their own car as well as the team they wanted to copy, be it Williams, Ferrari, McLaren or Benetton. Then they'd model their new parts to be as close to the original as they could possibly get, using reference photos of both cars to see where they needed to take things. Very clever stuff. And I genuinely mean that, it was incredibly clever. What Racing Point did was so painstaking they should actually be getting applauded for this rather than criticised. And it's not like what they did was a new thing, either, because teams have copied incredibly closely for, well, forever, in all forms of motorsport. When Jim Clark won the 1965 Indy 500, most of the 1966 grid was made up of Lotus clones. The first Arrows car was a rip-off of the shadow car of the time, and in the 90s with Tom Walkinshaw and Flavio Briatore having so many fingers in so many pies, the Ligier of 1996 was a French Benetton. Red Bull we've already mentioned, and the 2007 Super Aguri was the 2006 Honda, with Sauber cloning the Ferraris for several years in the 2000s. But the thing is, with the racing point, it worked. And that's what pissed everybody off. Racing Point was working overtime on this project, with new front wings being made at an absolutely mental rate. Bits were chopped and changed and the data was put in the simulator to see how it stacked up. When Checo and Stroll drove the 2020 car in the simulator, the differences were stark between 2019 and 2020. The feeling among the team was, if we've got these numbers right, the car is going to be absolutely fantastic. When it turned up for testing at the start of 2020, this being just before the lockdowns hit Europe, everybody was looking at this racing point and going, hang on a second, what the hell is this? While Mercedes looked at it like the pointing Spider-Man meme. So how close were the two cars, really? Well, strip them of their paint and you're going to have a very hard time deducing which one is which. But there are some subtle differences that if you know where to look, you can tell them apart. The Racing Point has a slimmer nose, and a much more prominent bulbous part right on the end of that nose, where the team's logo is. It's much more rounded than on the Mercedes, and there's also a couple of extra winglets where the driver's number is on the nose as well. As for the rest of it? Yeah, okay, it's 99.7% the same. And they did all of that 
from photographs. All of it. But it does have its drawbacks. Just because you've copied something doesn't mean you can understand it. Just look at my year 10 maths homework. The thinking was, this new philosophy might gain them some ground on the mid-pack in the early part of the season, but when the upgrades need to come, will they actually do the desired job or send Racing Point backwards? Because any upgrades they do will have to be close to what Mercedes brought to that car. Although the time Racing Point spent with their car in the CFD software in the wind tunnel did allow them to understand quite a bit of what was going on. And that was actually shown in the results for that, um, well, somewhat crazy 2020 season. Checo was 6th in the opening round in Austria, and then 6th again at the same track the following weekend. Stroll meanwhile retired from the opening round but then went on a long run of point scores, capping it off with a podium at the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. He then retired from the Tuscan Grand Prix and the Russian Grand Prix before missing the Eiffel Grand Prix due to testing positive for Covid. Checo meanwhile came back for the Spanish Grand Prix and scored points galore, with the Bahrain Grand Prix interrupting that run. It also needs to be pointed out here that at the Turkish Grand Prix, Stroll had actually qualified on pole and Checo finished on the podium. Stroll meanwhile dropped down to 9th after leading for most of that race. After the Styrian Grand Prix, the second race in Austria that year, Renault launched a protest against the legality of the car's brake ducts, saying that they might have copied Mercedes a bit too well. The FIA confiscated the brake ducts and asked Mercedes to provide theirs so they could check them. Renault would also protest the Hungarian Grand Prix and the British Grand Prix, while Ferrari also filed a protest. While the car itself was deemed fully legal, the brake ducts were not. This being because the FIA said that the design of the ducts was based off Mercedes design, so therefore Racing Point could not be the designers. They were fined €400,000 and 15 points were deducted. While other teams acknowledge the fact that copying happens because, well, all of them do it, even the ones at the top end of the pecking order, the issue now was how far Racing Point had taken things to get their car like this. And to be fair to them, they did admit that they'd taken some bits of the Mercedes and gone, yeah, we're looking at how they're doing things, but I don't think anybody realised just how far they were going to take it. And some people online did actually defend Racing Point saying, well, the other teams could do it, they're just choosing not to. And the reason that other teams aren't copying at the same extent that Racing Point had done is because of things like their engines, their existing philosophies and everything else, as well as the potential for it to go horribly wrong. But Racing Point had got it so right, that's why these discussions had begun. And Zach Brown wanted clarification on things, because what was going to stop somebody else doing something similar later on down the line? And there was some talk that the car could be disqualified, but disqualifying the whole car and team during the 2020 season of all seasons probably wouldn't have done much good in the grand scheme of things, despite Racing Point essentially flat out admitting that they'd copy the 2019 Mercedes. Although, if the stewards did find in favour of Racing Point, Brown didn't think that the issue was going to go away. After all, the FIA had already deemed dual axis steering or DAS legal on the Mercedes cars, and Red Bull didn't shut up about it for the rest of the season. Meanwhile, after the decision was made about the brake ducts, at least five other teams filed another protest. They believed that the FIA wasn't properly penalising Racing Point for those illegal parts, because Racing Point was allowed to keep running those ducts for the rest of the season. So what's the point? At least, in the minds of those five other teams. So why were the brake ducts such an issue? Well, Racing Point had apparently bought them from Mercedes in 2019, which they were allowed to do. This being before the number of listed parts shrunk for later years. A racing point could, in theory, use those same brake ducts for 2020 because they bought them before the ban, which is one hell of a grey area in the rules to exploit. But the FIA didn't see it that way. As it was in 2020, racing point had to do their own brake ducts, and copying slash using any that were already bought wasn't covered. Hence the fines and everything else. But what about the overall car, I hear you ask? They didn't design that either. And that is a very good point. But the grey area with this one was, Racing Point had put in so much effort into copying the Mercedes, they still had to put in a lot of work to try and understand how the car actually functioned aerodynamically, and designing things like the barge boards, the under tray, and the diffusers. Stuff that is incredibly hard to look at on photographs unless the Mercedes was being craned off the track, which didn't happen very often. The general consensus here is, Racing Point had copied the aero philosophy, not the actual car. They had no blueprints to work with, just their eyes, so it was an interpretation 
rather than a copy. It's all very technical and I think the fact that they had to do their own floor and diffuser along with all the other intricate parts helped them out here. But whatever they did, they unlocked a lot of pace. At the Sakir Grand Prix, which was the second race in Bahrain, Checo won the race, with Stroll in third. That race is also quite notable because it had been the first time since the 1991 German Grand Prix that there had not been somebody called Schumacher or Hamilton on the grid. Racing Point would finish fourth overall in the Constructors that year. So did the car actually work then? Well, it's a mixture of column A, which is yes, and a bit of column B, which is who's to say? Because there were circumstances working with and against Racing Point. The first being, it was the 2020 season, a year that was a bit upside down for a number of reasons. Some teams were just getting through, and the calendar was all over the place, and it was a shorter season than normal. At the same time, this was also the year after Ferrari's secret deal with the FIA, where the engines were suspiciously underpowered for the entirety of the season, but, well, that's one thing that helped Racing Point out at least. I think Ferrari was sixth that year, it was ridiculous how slow they were. But on the flip side, the performance was definitely there. Without the 15 point deduction for the iffy brake ducks, Racing Point would have actually finished third in the championship, ahead of McLaren. But there was still this sour taste in people's mouths, because as already mentioned, the project had worked a bit too well. Scrolling through the internet, I've seen several comments saying, I can't wait for them to not make Q3 in Australia after all that cocky talk they've been doing. These comments being left in 2019 when Racing Point started doing the upgrades of that 2019 car, and obviously before the Australian Grand Prix of 2020 was cancelled. I just want Andy Green to squirm because he's an arrogant ass. They'll fall back the second the other teams start adding upgrades. They're going to look a lot like BAR did in 1999. But they didn't look like BAR in 1999. They talked the talk and they ended up actually walking the walk. They got podiums, they even got a win, so yeah. They did what they set out to do, although the uniqueness of that season definitely helped out with things. But in 2021, with the team now becoming Aston Martin, that's when it bit them in the ass. The floor changes came in and the regulations were in use for another year. The current cars were supposed to come in for 2021, not 2022. It was all delayed 12 months because of the pandemic. Mercedes stayed at the top, fighting for the championship, while Aston had to use a modified car that was based off somebody else's car that they couldn't get their heads around anymore. At least, that's what it looked like. But to have copied another team's car so closely from just photographs was a mammoth undertaking, and could have gone horribly wrong as much as it seemed to go so right for them. So the question is, what is Adrian Newey going to cook up for 2026? Will Aston Martin do what Racing Point did in 2020, end up being right near the top and potentially start winning races? So then, a look at the pink Mercedes of 2020, the tracing point as it became known. If this has been a fun look through the motorsport history books, then do give the video a like so I know a good job was done. And for more from the channel, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything else that I do around here. Massive thanks as ever go out to the mad lads over at Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help with the image purchases or otherwise keep the lights on, there'll be a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, affiliates and anything else you might want or need to know. Or well, there's super thanks if you just want to do a one and done donation, and there's also memberships if you want to do Patreon, but without going through Patreon. So until next time, I've been Aidan Moord, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.